So, Professor Sen, we are now on live broadcast. So let me um, begin by introducing you. And in some ways, you don't need any introductions because those who have dialed in today belong probably to those, um, you know, worldwide networks that have accompanied you in your journey as an Indian economist, as a philosopher, as a Nobel laureate in economic science and for so many other things, but particularly in the field of development, which brings us together today here and that notion of human development, you have been a pioneer for decades and you remain a reference point in terms of um, both the work that you have done and the ethic that you have brought to this debate. As UNDP's administrator, the head of the organization at this particular moment in time, and you have seen quite a number of administrators come and go over the years, I also want to say it's a particular pleasure and honor for me because I, as a young development economist at the time in Queen Elizabeth House in Oxford, was studying your books, um, was inspired by your work, <laughs> and have since then found myself time and again crossing paths with um, the centerpiece of your thinking about development. And now, um, in my capacity as head of UNDP, I find myself in this wonderful position where with the Human Development Report, we once again can connect and um, find also some inspiration in your continued thinking and engagement on issues around development, around freedom. And I also want to emphasize the conversation today is meant to be one, for as I said, that speaks to you both as an economist and as a philosopher, as somebody who has looked at the materiality of development, but also very much at the morality of development, if I may just put it like that. Yeah. And somewhere I read also that, you know, if you had not received the Nobel Prize for economics um, and there had been one for philosophy, you would have won that one. So I think it is in your life's journey. And I want to begin with that, perhaps that binary choices was never really part of the way you looked at life. I mean, from the beginnings in India, but then as an academic, and then as really a pioneer in thinking about um, welfare economics and the way that we could conceptualize development progress, you rejected early on any notion of singular um, metrics or um, oversimplification. And I want to begin by just asking you to perhaps share a little bit that journey that you embarked on from India then to Cambridge as a young economist. What triggered your passion for this field? What led you then to think of development as freedom, that whole narrative that became a thread in your whole life's work? Um, just to understand a little bit more where young Amatya Sen began, because so many who are listening today may be students, they may be young practitioners, and I think it would be wonderful if you could share a little bit of that beginnings of the journey. That's terribly kind of you. You know, I, uh, it isn't a very glorious history, but uh, I was very involved. Uh, I was a student in, uh, in school, in Santa Indicator, which was established by the poet Ravindra Tagore. And if you think about his own priorities, I would say the two priorities that he had most strongly was the idea of freedom, which is very uh, important uh, in, in, his, in his life, and, and, and a, a humanity that included everyone. And uh, that, uh, I mean, he was, uh, he, he had denominational background. He was an Indian, he was a, uh, Indian citizen. He was a part of the British Empire. Uh, he was in the region a Hindu, uh, but uh, he never particularly pursued that in any way, big, deep way. And but when he uh, described himself, he always showed a much wider perspective. In fact, when he was giving his Hibbert lectures in, in Oxford in the 1930s, when he was asked, uh, what's his background? So he said, well, I really have more than one background. It is a bit of the Hindu background in it, a bit of the Muslim background in it, and a bit of the Western influence uh, in it. All these are mine. Um, and he often said such things as that anything 
that we are able to enjoy and and make any use of instantly becomes ours. Uh, it's not a so it is no uh, kind of exclusion in that. This is a very big issue now, uh, and if I may put in a footnote here, I think one of the ways that India has, I think, switched a lot recently is the tendency on the ruling powers to see India more and more as a Hindu country rather than as a uh, multi-religious, multi-ethnic uh, country interested in a, in a in connection with the whole of the world. So that was part of the background I came with. Um, there was a strong influence of Buddhism, and you might remember that when Buddha left his home, right. he uh, had to search enlightenment. The things that he particularly was concerned with was mortality, uh, morbidity, and uh, lack of education. And uh, when I was sitting down with Mago Vilhak to make the first human development index, so I said, you know, we almost got back to where Buddha was in 600 BC. <laughs> because these are the things which are now make up the human development index, but these are the concerns that made Buddha leave home and see how we can get anywhere. So I arrived in, in Cambridge with a kind of background, having studied a bit in Calcutta too, after Santa Niketan. And, uh, and of course, my woman was a very close friend. I met him on the first day that I was going to my class. There was Maybe just for those who may not be familiar with um, the name, Mabubul Haq became your um, comrade in arms, if I may say so. You have even said he was the perpetrator of trying to challenge at the time uh, the notions of traditional economic measures of progress. And both of you were students together. And I remember in what you have written that it was he who then approached you also later in, in trying to reconnect that original friendship from Cambridge in the context of rethinking human development. Is that a fair summary? That is indeed a very fair summary. But I remember sitting down with him in my first weekend in Cambridge and having some critical things to say about the gross domestic product. And because Mabu was uh, very critical of it, as was I. And uh, we had a kind of kindred spirit in finding a kind of number game, which didn't mean as much to human uh, life as uh, the position it was given um, tended to pretend that it had. So, so I, I spent quite a lot of time in this for uh, the two years that we were undergraduate together, we had both done some higher education before coming to Cambridge. So we got our VAs in two years, and then he went off to Yale, I stayed on in Cambridge. But we remained in touch, and from time to time I heard he was doing certain things. And then suddenly in 89, uh, he told me, drop everything, come on here, and we are going to produce measurements that are a lot better than gross domestic product. And we are going to do it in UNDP. So I said, what has happened? He said, well, and Marvel said, as you know, I never had any resources, but the UNDP administrator, that is your predecessor, says that he will support me if I do some research on that. So I told him that I was going to get a friend of mine namely me, to come over to New York and sit down with him and plan all this, which I did and enjoyed. Well, and in some ways, the rest is history because we meet this year, President Sen, on the 30th anniversary, that, uh, that partnership, that uh, economic uh, challenging conspiracy of the time gave birth to the Human Development Report, the concept, the narrative of human development. It gave birth to the Human Development Index and um, 30 years later, the Human Development Report remains one of those annual moments where we really reflect on the state of development thinking. But if I could just ask you, um, in some ways you had brought a very sophisticated 
view of development um, into your research and into your publications. And here was Mabub al -Haq, who was trying to force, um, well, in one sense, challenge a very simplistic measure of progress, GDP, gross domestic product, challenge it head on. And I know that you both at the time had very intense debates because any index is always a simplification, maybe even an oversimplification. Yeah. What persuaded you at the time to embrace this notion of the human development index with uh, you know, going beyond income to bring capabilities in education, um, uh, the notion of freedom, so to speak, that you had conceptualized, but suddenly find it in, in um, squeezed through a, a filter into a human development index. What made you go along with it and why do you believe it has proven quite resilient for so long? Well, I think the credit goes mostly to Mahmoud Bel uh, He knew what he was going to do. Uh, I, I knew that we wanted something different from what we had, but um, I didn't have the clarity that I think Mabu had. And he knew I was working on things which were rather mathematical, dealing with social choice theory. And when I came, he said, look, we're not going to do anything that anyone speaking of a newspaper cannot follow. So it has to be simple, not simplistic. On the other hand, um, all the sophisticated ideas you have had to be formed into the measurement as well as the tables that we will be presenting. Uh, we had a bit of a debate about whether we can do with one index like GDP, uh, HDI. Eventually, I helped Madhu to uh, create the HDI, but at that time, I was quite skeptical. And I said, look, don't look for one number like GDP. Yeah, there you are imitating GDP's worst error, namely to think that such complicated life like of being happy, unhappy, being contented and, 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 and being well uh, can all be captured in some one number. You, you know, you ask how a person is and he says 37. And that can't mean very much to any thinking human being. And Lobo gradually got me um, to accept that if we did not have one number uh, and if we had a set of tables, he said, uh, Mabu said, look, uh, people would admire the table that you present or you work and we together present to the world. But when it comes to using something, you know, they would say, well, what do we know about Zimbabwe or what do we know about Zambia? The first thought would be a GDP thing. So in order to compete with GDP, you need something with the same degree of simplicity that GDP has, accepting it has to reflect much more than GDP does. GDP is, after all, the value of commodities primarily in the market economy. But we want to know how long their lives are and so on. And so then we sat down and I was rather persuaded by his argument, and we thought of some basic ingredient that HDI, and of course the difficulty is that they come different units. Life expectancy is number of years. Uh, mortality is a number about how many per thousand. Uh, uh, education is people going to school, uh, or how many years of schooling, and so on. So, we had to somehow put them together, and the weighting problem is mathematically quite complicated. But in particular, it had to make sense, and at the same time, um, not uh, confound people. Uh, what you just referred to remains, in a sense, the great debate, isn't it? The, the weighting is one um, debate what what is it that truly matters you have been a very strong and clear proponent of this notion of capabilities um, which has to some extent a very individual perspective and yet the index was also an expression of a collective possibility and opportunity and measurement of progress do you think um, this these two dimensions 
have come together in an appropriate way in the Human Development Index, because it was not only the individual we were trying to, um, let's say, assess in terms of development progress, development possibilities, but we wanted to find a way to measure how nations are progressing. And if you look back as an economist today, are you still perplexed by how the world is holding on to this very crude measurement and yardstick of GDP, even though so much more sophisticated data measurements, uh, multidimensional poverty index, the human development index um, have emerged alongside it. And, and what would you attribute that to, this almost clinging on to this oversimplified economic measure when we know that development simply is not captured in either individual perception or um, national resilience, uh, if you use that. Yeah, I think the, the real issue there is that the GDP can appeal to people who don't want to go into complication about uh, how satisfied your life is, how long it is, uh, what's the value of education in your life, and so on. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, uh, at one stage says uh, that we can't begin to understand the world unless we argue about it. And that argument has not gone on sufficiently for the GDP. And HDI was the one way of in introducing that argument. And to some extent, we did win. The HDI is widely used, not perhaps as widely as GDP, but it certainly uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, uh, I have to say, and, and this is not the occasion to discuss it, as the HDI stand, some of the formulation has been changed, particularly using the geometric mean rather than arithmetic mean. I won't go into it. I think that was a mistake. And I'm on record that the UNDP ought to correct that. <laughs> and, uh, and I believe it will be, though not yet this year. But um, we had to do the best we can with the information that we have, the information in which human beings are interested and which they can follow and on which, and this is where the Kantian perspective is very important, on which they can argue. They should be able to argue and say, I don't like it, why not? Uh, I think among the best things I recollect in my days with Mabu, uh, you know, he wanted me to resign jobs and come and join him. I said, I can't do it. I'll continue to teach, but I will come every second month or so and spend maybe four or five days with you. And we, we spent time together. We argued with each other. I insisted that Mabu takes me to reasonable restaurants. And we went to some Chinese and, and Indo-Pakistani restaurants. And we had good arguments. And something did emerge. And the and in which um, um, Mabu's vision was the central thing. And but uh, even though a lot of um, technicalities went into it, they were very difficult to um, uh, focus on so that they, they had to be done in a kind of uh, almost non-explicit way uh, so that the waiting, waiting years, uh, life, years of schooling, uh, uh, what grade you do, etc. all these put together requires quite a bit of uh, thinking about how to proceed. There was a philosophical concern um, very much behind um, uh, these things. And, uh, well, I, and to some extent, as I said, the, the journey continues because um, as you say, it, it is one of discovery. It is also one of, uh, let's say, calibrating an index. If I may just, take you into two, let's say, very contemporary challenges we face. I and mean, for a long time, development also in the traditional sense of income per capita, et cetera, was 
associated with the eradication of extreme poverty. You know, if you've got World Bank figures above $1.90 or, you know, the numbers have evolved over time, that was progress. And, you know, the eradication of extreme poverty remains a centerpiece of the development agenda of any country. But how do you um, see the, the notion of inequality today having become such a prominent part? I mean, you, you saw it already in the very early research and writings you did over famines, but I think the world has never been as acutely aware of how corrosive inequality is to communities, societies, to economies, and therefore to the fundamental presumptions about development. And perhaps you could just share a, a, a contemporary view of where will inequality as, you know, not just a critique of development, but rather as a way of thinking about achieving better development take us over the next few years. And I'll perhaps come back to that later on also in the context of COVID and what, what follows it. Yeah, uh, I think that's a very exciting question. Um, the, um, um, the issue of inequality had not engaged the world very much until fairly recently. It came in in very general statements like Rousseau praising equality and equity and like the French Revolution talking about equity uh, as the Bastille fell and so on. But it didn't have a very concrete thing. But I think the practical use of policy played a part in that. And just to give an example, the, during the Second World War, uh, Britain had relatively little food because it was difficult to get the ships into Britain and Britain didn't grow enough food uh, to, to, to have the normal food supply per head. So they thought that they had to deal with that. They were afraid of, of people uh, having uh, undernourishment. So they introduced rationing and control. And so suddenly, even the very poor could get food at a very low price, at low control price. And one result of the uh, change in public policy uh, when Britain had less food than it ever had in the past, uh, one result of it was suddenly undernourishment fell, became smaller in, in Britain, and indeed acute undernourishment completely disappeared. And what happened is that that requirement of equality or equity in the distribution of food became a factor at the time when Britain was fighting a war. So there were shoulder to shoulder uh, cooperation between people. Uh, and at the same time, there was an understanding that somehow people would have to make sacrifice uh, in order to allow the very poor to have their turn now. So I think that led to uh, a, a dramatic increase in life expectancy in, in Britain. For example, a normal year of Britain was having a life expectancy increase of one year or one and a half years. But in the war year of the 1940s, Britain had a seven year increase in life expectancy. And similarly, there was a sharing of medical facilities. And that led to the National Health Service, which became important in Britain and in the rest of Europe. Uh, so all this was, the equality was being uh, not only thought of as an abstract principle, but as something as a part of public policy. And unfortunately, and you mentioned the, uh, the COVID issue, that the way the uh, um, um, COVID uh, uh, control is being dealt with, uh, it doesn't often have that feature. It doesn't have in many countries. In America, for example, um, still the African-Americans uh, have disproportionately high uh, uh, suffering from, from uh, coronavirus. Uh, well, in many ways, it has been a, a great revealer, isn't it? I think to, to many of us, 
um, we knew statistically or we knew intuitively that inequalities were growing, but COVID-19 in, in many ways has been a, like somebody put on the stadium lights suddenly and, and we have seen yeah. many of these you know, revelations about the fissures that are there. Yeah, but there's, I, there's more, more lessons to be learned from that though. I was so, just going to say, yeah. one thing is revelation and to see it, the, the question is everybody now uses the term don't go back to, you know, before to go back to normal, build better forward, um, you know, many different phrases are used. Do you sense a moment in time where COVID-19 could be one of those watershed moments? Could it be the catalyst for something quite transformative that some are projecting into this moment in history? Or do you think the likelihood is that we simply gravitate to somewhere where we were before in a year or two or three? Well, I wish I could say that it will have the same kind of educational effect as, uh, as the food problem in, 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 in Europe did have. So far, uh, the, there are some signs that we will recognize that issue, but the recognition has been fairly limited. And it's, uh, it's particularly limited in some countries, United States being one of them. Uh, one of your, uh, um, one of your several countries of uh, origin, namely Brazil, also had my country, India, has had a very unequal treatment uh, of people. And the if you are in, uh, you know, worker, particularly temporary worker, far away from home, they were treated very badly indeed in the lockdown. The lockdown came with a four hour notice and suddenly people couldn't find a job on which they defended for their daily wage. Uh, they couldn't go back to home because the trains, buses, everything was shut. Uh, and, and the result was a very unequal treatment. And if you look at the mortality, they haven't done those calculations. I think they're afraid of doing it. If you can see how badly the uh, underdogs of society have done compared with the others. Uh, and not only that India had a very large um, casualty from, from COVID, but actually the inequality in the suffering is, is very large indeed. But could I um, perhaps suggest one hopeful glimmer that in the suspension in many countries, particularly those who could afford it, who had the fiscal space of virtually every tenet of economic orthodoxy, whether it's a Washington consensus or as some have called it a, a Brussels consensus, and you know, whether it's public debt, whether it is the stimulus package, and we, we simply, through everything that has been sort of part of that classical economic policy framework of fiscal discipline overboard and mobilized extraordinary resources. And two things have happened, I think, just as a phenomenon, who knows what the consequence, the role of the state in the midst of this great disruption is um, as central to public attention as it probably has been for the last 30 years in a development sense. And secondly, we have seen the recognition that social cohesion required very significant social um, temporary income, uh, whether it is the furlough schemes, the unemployment benefits, the help for small and medium scale businesses. And UNDP, as you may have followed a few months ago, came back from all its surveys uh, of the COVID impact and uh, began to argue for a temporary basic income response. And that has opened within countries that could afford it. Yes. Perhaps a new frontier of looking at inequality, poverty and vulnerability uh, in ways that might persist beyond the COVID crisis. Yeah, I know I entirely agree. And I think um, the, what we have to do is to differentiate between those where lessons were coming in um, with um, policy implications very strongly and those where uh, there were reluctance to go further in this. UNDP, of course, has been one of the heroes of of pointing out why you need temporary income for a reason that John Leonard Keynes would have easily recognized uh, because it's nothing complicated thought, but it's something 
UN leaders played a very big part in, in, in making the world understand. But if you look at uh, the United States, it did go through a first uh, wave of, of uh, of uh, temporary income creation, but in the second one, they stopped and they haven't yet passed it. We have to see whether they, under the Biden administration, it will go through quickly. And similarly, um, the treatment of uh, the poor uh, through such things as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, almost the basic income. Uh, that it, it can have a big reach, which it had not fully been uh, harvested yet. And, and that's why uh, we celebrate particularly the role of UNDC in making the world understand uh, how important this is. Uh, these are debates that go back a long time whenever there are problems. Uh, uh, I was talking about John, John Renatain in 1930, but earlier than that, just then there was the First World War, when the Va Versailles Treaty came in, and, and uh, between Britain, France, and the United States, um, Germany had to pay a huge amount of, of reparations. And the result of it was, as Keynes predicted, uh, ruination of the German economy. And through that, because of interconnection between economies, ruination of much of rest of Europe as well. And of course, uh, preparation of ground for the Second World War. So uh, there's a lot to be learned in going away from orthodox economic theory and replace it by lessons from unorthodox economic theory, which already exists. There are people who have talked about it. Adam Smith even talked about it in the 70, in his 1776 book. Uh, there were talk about it, the Marque de Condorcet uh, in the uh, talk. So uh, there's in a background that we ought to open-mindedly look at. And I think I emphasize this because to me, the attraction of UNDC and HDR, um, um, of course, the main attraction was I was working with a friend, namely Mamoul Hub, and he also got together other friends who came and joined us and we chatted and argued uh, in a Kantian way. But the, um, the fact is that there is a lot of understanding in the world, um, which um, the UNDC at that time was giving expression to. That would apply even to the environmental issue, which I know is an issue in which you have been very involved, and I, where there is a lot to be done on the basis like of what we already you know. To that realm, uh, if you allow me, because um, we still have a couple of Q and A's also, and I know your time is limited. But if I can just reassure you, and certainly that has been our focus in these nine, ten months now of, of this pandemic, um, UNDP was asked by the Secretary General to provide a technical lead in terms of the socio-economic assessments, and this is where this unique presence on the ground, together with our UN sister agents, but also many partners, our counterparts in government, enabled us to. Uh, produce, you know, over 130 uh, assessments of the impact and the measures that are being taken and to work with governments on the recovery strategies. And I, I want to just validate that that principle that led to, in a sense, driving the HDI narrative at the time, namely that bringing together of real life experiences, we have just been reminded of that in COVID and the notion of a temporary basic income was based on what we saw countries standing up overnight and with the digital infrastructure and, and possibilities, things have become possible today that perhaps would not logistically have been doable, but conceptually certainly are challenging fundamental assumptions in, in development that I think will be with us for a while. But if you allow me, Professor Sen, may I take you for a moment into that, uh, that territory that you just um, alluded to? 
human development, very anthropocentric. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And, you know, in some ways, development is all about humans because, you know, the planet doesn't need development in order to uh, exist. But um, we have reached a point that, uh, in this year's human development report, we um, took a decision that was not easy at first to embrace this discussion around moving to a new geologic era, which some are still looking at in terms of scientific terms, but conceptually, the notion of living in the Anthropocene, namely that humans who used to be shaped by the planet for the first time in a geological sense really are shaping the planet. And one of the implications of that for development thinking, for development choices that we exercise, and is a human development report really still contemporary and adequate if it cannot capture the place that people and their development choices occupy in the larger context of the planet? And so this year, the report uh, that will be launched in December, The Next Frontier, Human Development and the Anthropocene, tries to bring these narratives together beyond just you know, environmental indices or you know, greening human development. It is a, a synthesis that um, we are attempting. And I wonder what, what you're thinking is over the years, because when you began your career um, and your research, certainly the link between poor people and natural resources was self-evident, including the, the you know, alienation, the deprivation fundamental rights to land and water, etc. But today we have reached a point where not only at the local level, but really in a atmospheric, in a biosphere sense, fundamental life support systems are under stress. So human development choices inextricably need to be informed by their consequences on, on nature, let's say writ large. Have you in your own thinking in recent years evolved your own approach to this because it is something that has to enlarge our our lens our thinking and and the hgr this year has taken up that challenge yes no i i i wish i could say that i've done a lot of work on that which i haven't but um, i think one of the things that i i learned from our work is that we have to uh, carry on our work at two different levels at one level, we are making less ground, but without being quite sure what its implication will be for things here and now. And the other is to do things here and now and see where we are going. And Mavu's concern was primarily the latter here and now, but he was always uh, in favor of making new ground, but not go ahead without being sure what its implications will be on here and now. At one occasion, I remember I got a letter from Mabu saying the real difficulty with the environmentalists, as he put it uh, to me, is that they have great sympathy for the poor in the future, but very little for the poor today. And, and he was saying that we should not end up neglecting the poor today in order to take care of the poor in the future. Now, there are all kinds of issues in treating the Earth as a, as a, as a planet and how they interrelate. Uh, and at the level of science, there is no escape from taking that more integrative view. And certainly we ought to do it. To what extent it should immediately get into our story uh, when there is a danger that some of the acute uh, needs, some of the acute uh, sufferings uh, would be neglected as a result, uh, then there, there's a question there. So it's really a matter of um, balance. Uh, and I'm, I, would, I, I haven't seen very much of exactly where uh, the uh, uh, UNDP has gone in, in terms of the, um, the, the planetary thinking. But certainly, it's something which we have every reason to support. No, and I think you allude to an era where I think the, the 
narrative of environmental sustainability, or as you quoted Mahbub al Haq, the environmental proponents, um, emerged in an era where development was blind to the environment. So I think inevitably one was operating in two parallel universes, even though it was one reality, whether for a yeah. farmer or for a, a, you know, a polluted city. I think where we are today and where I would debate with Mahbub al Haq, who I have the deepest respect for, is that to some extent, it goes back to a core concept in your own thinking, Professor Sen, which is freedom. The neglect of that um, sustainability of our development choices ultimately deprives the next generation of freedoms, of capabilities. It has become uh, not something that is hypothetical and only attributable to some. It now affects an entire functioning planet. And I just want to assure you that when the report comes out in December, we are bracing ourselves for many intense debates and it is not the answer we are producing, but rather we are beginning to offer a reframing of uh, human development in a reality that is today so much more existential. And in that sense, it is also a report about inequality between one generation and another, its choices mm -hmm. and the, the impact it has on, on the next generation. But I think to my Bubal Hack's point, the impacts that we once, you know, deemed to be more in the realm of science fiction or in the 22nd century have fast forwarded into the present. And we don't have time to explore that today, but I appreciate very much that you uh, remind us of that need that human development must center around an understanding of what it implies for human beings today, tomorrow, and in generations downstream. And I think that's where we are searching for a, a good balance. I very much look forward to seeing what the When will it be coming out? Yeah. It will be launched on the 15th of December uh, with a global launch. Um, and um, to everybody who is listening, uh, please um, just have a look on the Human Development Report Office's website or UNDP's website in early December, and uh, we will send it to, to you also, Professor Sen. And you, yeah. have, in fact, have a excerpt in there about your work with Mahbub al Haq, which you kindly contributed as a reminder of where the origins are. But I, I have to, for a moment, surrender my privilege of engaging with you in this conversation to our moderator, June, because we also had a couple of um, uh, questions that have uh, come in and that she will share with you. And I rejoin you at the end of the session, if you can give us a couple more minutes. Yeah. Thank you. June, over to you. Well, thank you, Professor Sen, and <laughs> hello <laughs> um, for your thought-provoking and very fascinating conversation today. Uh, we will now move to the questions and answers segment. Um, there's been tremendous level of interest in this conversation, and there are many, many questions coming through um, since the beginning of this uh, event started. Many of you have already been actively engaging in the Q&A and chat box at the bottom of the screen if you're joined by Zoom today. I will try to capture as many as we can, but unfortunately we will likely not be able to go through all of them given uh, the time constraints. Just a reminder though, please keep your questions as simple and concise as possible and give a like with a thumbs up for your favorite questions if you see anything that are similar to yours. Uh, we will prioritize questions that generated the highest level of interest. So to kick off our Q&A session, um, it is my pleasure to introduce two of our youth representatives to each ask a question to you, Professor Sen and Administrator Seiner. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to one of the representatives, Lynn Rose. Thank you so much, June. Um, hello, I am Lynn Rose Jane Hannon, and I am based in the Philippines and I'm part of the 16 by 16 initiative and Young Women Plus for Peace and Leadership Philippines. It's a program of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, working closely with young women and young LGBT leaders in the country advocating for peace, human rights and gender equality. So my question to Professor Sen and Administrator Steiner, and earlier it was mentioned, you know, that inequality is one of the contemporary challenges of development and reflecting on our experiences with working with young women in the communities, I believe that achieving gender equality by promoting and supporting the rights and active roles of diverse groups of women is central as we reflect on development and its future. So given the urgency and magnitude of the global challenges that our world is facing, which disproportionately affect women, in particular young women and girls, 
what are your thoughts on how to best prevent and reduce women's intersecting discriminations and vulnerabilities and on how to address gender-based violence? Thank you so much. And now I'll hand it over to my fellow youth representative, Charles, over to you. Could I just make a small remark, Charles, before you start? Just speak a little bit slower because we have many people in many countries who may not have English as their first, second, or third language. So just so that everybody can follow your, your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so it's a like great pleasure and, um, and a privilege indeed for me to join this great session, quite insightful and inspiring. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Sen. So my name is Charles Kajoroeka. I work I, I, as a human rights activist uh, in Malawi civil society. I am based in Malawi and um, particularly our work borders around building youth agency, uh, ensuring that young people really take active role in advancing uh, development, particularly uh, directed at confronting corruption, inequality, and advocating for civic education. My specific question to you, Prof, uh, uh, is, um, uh, bordering around uh, a violent exclusion that young people face in development. And um, despite the global commitment to leave no one behind, young people continue to face ex a violent exclusion from participating in economic activities and development processes, particularly in the developing uh, countries like Malawi. In this regard, Prof, in what ways can we empower young people in their efforts to push back against violent exclusion and lead the future efforts for development? Thank you so much, Prof. And back to you, June. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, Rose, and Charles. And now I'll hand it over to both of you to answer some of their questions. Thanks. Well, I think these are very interesting questions indeed. Um, so first to deal with the question that came from Philippines. Uh, uh, I think the issue of gender inequality is one of the more complicated ones uh, in the world because it's unlike many inequalities where there are uh, clearly visible signs of inequality everywhere, quite often gender inequality doesn't have that feature. It had that feature because um, it could have had that feature, but um, in often the men and women who are, uh, have these unequal lives uh, are in the same family, uh, so that you may not be able to see how much inequality there is. So I think the, there are at least three things to think about here. One is the identification of inequality, and they could be of many different types. And it's important not to forget any in pursuit of uh, some. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we have to take up all the inequality problems of gender with equal um, vehemence immediately, but we can't ignore it. They may have sometimes uh, gender inequality in the form of uh, neglect of young girls compared with young boys in nutrition and many other things. You could have inequality in terms of boy preference whereby um, women um, um, uh, are maltreated um, in in not only life, but also uh, you might find gender specific abortion of female fetuses, which is quite common in a number of countries. Um, but on the other hand, then there are others like um, um, girls being neglected when it comes to schooling. Uh, and uh, girls being neglected uh, when it comes to specialized education or technical education. Uh, or you can find that girls don't get um, employment 
in um, important government services, uh, which uh, men do, and similarly, there could be inequality in business. So in different ways, the business inequality may apply in Japan, but not the neglect of um, girls with a voice um, as children in terms of nutritional care. But you might find that in West Asia or South Asia. And, and so you have to identify what the problems are. Secondly, to find out uh, how we might be able to handle each of these problems. They sometimes interrelate, but they don't always interrelate, uh, and find ways and means of dealing with it. And the more airing and more discussion there is on this, uh, the more uh, chances are, um, uh, the more chances there will be to do things about um, the, the, um, to eliminate these inequalities. And the third thing I would say is that when it's clear what the problems are and how it could be dealt with, to not hesitate to uh, press ahead with um, remedies that could be sought uh, through a variety of organizations. Sometimes um, uh, this is done through women's organization. Sometimes it's done with gender sensitive human organizations. Um, uh, there's no reason why women's problems would interest only women. Uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that I was one of the founders of uh, the uh, the magazine and the institution uh, called Feminist Economics. This is not because I'm a woman, but because the subject interests me and I could participate uh, uh, in that. Uh, and um, actually sometimes this causes confusion since my name ends with YA on our chair. I often get letters uh, we begin by saying, dear Miss Sen, <laughs> which is quite common. And, and uh, my, one of my favorite letters was some, from someone who began by saying, dear Miss Sen, they will never understand us. <laughs> and <laughs> assuming an identity on my part, which wasn't true on the other hand, and it was also true in the sense that I am concerned with gender issues very strongly. So I think, so these are the ways in which we shouldn't let go of the feminine, uh, of the gender issue. There's no such thing. We'll come to that later. Now we have to deal with basic feeding and now we have to deal with basic hunger uh, and so on. Um, we have to bear all these issues in mind simultaneously. Um, the um, uh, other question concerned age uh, inequality and, and youth, yeah. And, and, and youth, I mean, the, the challenge of being a young person in today's yeah. stressed, stressed uh, world of, of jobs, unemployment, pandemics. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and that is a serious issue. Again, um, that requires quite a bit of diagnostic when that happens, to what extent uh, this does happen and how it could be stopped. I don't want to pretend to be an expert on every subject and therefore I wouldn't try to answer that question, but I'm delighted that issue was raised by someone I think who's I don't see him here, but uh, he came, who lives in Malai, I believe. And I think the main way of dealing with any problem is to press ahead and not let that subject be dropped in terms of saying, well, that's important, but there's something else more important. Uh, everything is very important in, in this world. And uh, I have to say that I haven't 
suffered personally from being uh, neglected when I was young. I, I got jobs when I was young uh, uh, and, uh, and I got attention, including through the UNDV <laughs> and others. But there are lots of cases when um, uh, the youth tend to get neglected. And when that happens, the main thing to recognize is to diagnose, to find the remedial steps, and then press ahead and not let go. I think that applies to the youth inequality just as much as it applies to gender inequality. Perhaps what, what I think has been most striking in this pandemic process, and, and, and you know, to Charles's point, is that you know the shutdown, the lockdowns, um, you know, almost a billion, more than a billion students essentially cease to have access to education. And again, extreme inequality between those who are able to switch on the digital platforms and those, you know, for instance, the country that I had the honor of and pleasure of living in for 10 years, Kenya, uh, essentially closed all public schools till the beginning of, of the new school year in January. Yeah. Now, this has a, a terrible impact, obviously, on, on, so, in, on so many levels. And even on the gender side, because there is a great concern, first of all, of increased gender-based violence at home, but also that perhaps a disproportionate number of young people may not return to school, particularly amongst girl learners, girl children. And um, so we are faced in parts of the world where the majority of the population is young, in inverted commas, with a, um, a disruption that amplifies by multiple factors already a frustrated young generation. I mean, we are often discussing nowadays youth as a problem because of extremism and uh, disenchantment, but actually, you know, the vast, vast majority of young people are looking for development opportunities. They're looking for development as freedom, but they're struggling to find it in many countries. And I think we, we as development professionals, as citizens are, um, I think, uh, under great pressure to come up with something more responsive because in many countries it's the majority of the population still, especially yeah. on the African continent. Yeah, no, indeed, I totally agree with what you said. And I think it's, it's uh, COVID, that is the aspect of COVID, which has received less attention than in fact it should have got. And it's really very important. And it's not only Kenya, but even in countries like, I don't know, better like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, this has been a major feature of the neglect that COVID has generated. Uh, the whole generation of students is missing out a whole year of education very often. So let me check with June. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. I know there are many and perhaps there is a way in which we can follow up after the session, but I think we are coming to the, the limit soon. But Jun, uh, over to you. And perhaps you can give a, a little, uh, in a minute, a, a sense of what kind of questions came in and pick one more out or one more participant. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Steiner. Um, we, as you can tell, have received incredible number of questions and it's Honestly, we have just little time to answer all of them. So we have um, just, as we mentioned earlier, based off of the popularity of the questions that you guys gave the thumbs up for. Um, so we have two questions for the final round of the Q&A for today. Uh, the first question is, when economies are focused on faster growth without considering development, is achieving the SDGs realistic? Is achieving what? The SDG sustainable development goals. Uh, yeah. For the 2030 agenda, is it realistic when countries and economies are only focused on faster growth and not considering um, yeah. development? And if I made the second question for this round, it'd be many donor countries are focusing on private sector for scale, sustainability and effectiveness. What is our view on this approach and can it encompass the true essence of human development? So it's focusing from the donor's perspective and their recent approach and how do we how do we manage that from the human development's perspective. So with those two questions, I will hand it over back to you, Professor Sen and uh, Minister Steiner. Well, I think the, um, 
um, um, a, a short answer to concentration only on growth, of course, is, is that it leaves out um, very many issues that are of central importance. And that, of course, is one of the uh, ways in which the human development uh, approach um, wanted to overcome the limitations of the uh, measurement world that tended to exist. And it figured, if I may take the liberty of being a bit personal, uh, it was among the things that Mabuola Hark and I discussed a lot in the, uh, when we were students together, undergraduates together in Cambridge in the 1950s. And we did think that uh, growth was a real problem uh, in the sense that, not that growth, there was anything wrong with it, but it just neglected many features and it gave people a sense of satisfaction that the country was doing very well when it was growing fast, even though it may turn out that it's neglecting healthcare, neglecting education, neglecting basic social relations. Uh, and given that fact, we need to go much beyond that. Now, in some ways, it has to be said that sustainable development goals, and I take it that's what you meant by SDG, sustainable development goals, they actually um, deal with some of the issues because you deal with um, those uh, goals which are sustainable. On the other hand, they may still be quite limited. Sustainable development goal may sustain uh, only a few aspects of human life which are important, but which need to be supplemented. So I think one of the things to recognize is the sustainable development goal is part of the remedy. It cannot be all of the remedy in dealing with uh, the issue about uh, growth. Now I'm trying to think what was the last question. Uh, uh, that was more focused on, you know, donor, the donor countries that have been, you know, a very central force in shaping the development discourse, the development agenda, um, are increasingly focusing on private sector for scale, yeah. sustainability and effectiveness. And um, what is your view on this approach? Can it encompass the true essence of human development? And I think it in part alludes to this fact that developed countries, the OECD world is increasingly extracting itself from being a key driver of development in the developing world, inverted commas, but also taking an increasingly narrow view of what matters in development. And um, can that really uh, succeed in answering to the human development uh, paradigm, discourse, and, and thinking that uh, we have just spent discussing? Yeah, I think it's a very intriguing question because many features of life um, have uh, some private features, uh, namely uh, the way whether we can buy a shirt or two or whether we can get a bed to lie on and so on. On the other hand, there are many other features like um, arrangement of public schooling, arrangement of public health care, which requires much more than a private perspective. So I think the, the way to think about it, it seems to me that you have to uh, differentiate between different types of needs that an economy and a society and human beings have and not neglect either side for the sake of pursuing the other. So this general idea that um, somehow uh, the state has no role, but it's, it's, it's a well-functioning market economy that we need will be a mistake. But the opposite will be a mistake too. It's interesting as we go back to the beginning of 
modern economics, uh, 1776, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, uh, at one stage in the, in the book, in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says, we want to have good political economy so that there is what he is describing as expansion uh, in the economy in a way that uh, is good for the people. By which I mean, he says, A, there has to be greater income of people so that they are able to use their income to get more of what they need and in the absence of which they would suffer. But secondly, it also means that the, there should be more income in the nation so that the state has the resources that it needs in order to be able to do those things which only the state can do. This is 1776, Adam Smith. And so he's he asking for this balance. And I think that is exactly right. And I would say uh, that thing, uh, that need for balance holds today as much as it did 200 years or more than 200 years ago in Adam Smith's time. Well, it's, it's a wonderful response on which to close our session together now, but I also want to remind all those who are listening that, <clears throat> for as I said, you have stayed faithful to one of the foundational convictions that has been with you all your life, which is that um, development ought to be, and I quote, about advancing the richness of human life rather than the richness of the economy in which human beings live, which is only a part of it. Thank you. And, uh, I was just reminded when you spoke that I had, you know, read this beforehand. And I want to thank you because, um, you know, sometimes in our world today, <clears throat> we have reasons to lose confidence in economic orthodoxy, in economic paradigms, sometimes in the discipline of economics also. I mean, as an as economist myself and, and um, somebody who, you know, saw its limitations and returned to it because it is still so significant in, a, yeah. <clears throat> in how we interact on policy decisions. I think there is something that has become very clear in recent years, and that is that this economic determinism that overrides everything else that is either normative, that is about freedom, about individuals, it has no future. And, you know, both people Remember the last couple of years before COVID-19, we had demonstrations all over the world. The body politic was spilling out onto the streets because our institutions, our choices that were given to us as citizens were not resonating. Whether it was Hong Kong or Paris or Santiago de Chile or Beirut, uh, New York, um, we have seen people flashing a red light on, on some of this very narrow economic thinking. And we have the planet doing the same with climate change and, and many other factors. And I think we are at a point, President Sen, where much of what you began to open the world's eyes to is coming even more into focus rather than being overtaken by another reality. Thank and that you. is why I am so grateful that you agreed to be our inaugural guest in what is just a, an attempt to try and bring to the reflections that we will have in our communities and our societies over the next few months and years about development choices because development is really about choices that we make as societies as communities as a global family of nations that we need to get beyond <clears throat> this notion that there is only one way and that is to go back to where we were and then we'll somehow figure out how to move forward yeah we are at a moment where the future of development truly has to be um carried as a discourse with the same notion of liberation that you brought with your thinking at the time. And that is why we wanted to combine the, uh, the person Amartya Sen and his life's work and that thread with the Human Development Report to a moment in time where I personally see UNDP as one of many, but an important space in which we must think about the future of development differently. And we welcome um, citizens from all over the world to be part of, of this um, reset that we are hoping for. 
Professor Sen, before I close, I don't know if you have any last thoughts um, um, as a farewell, because really people came to listen to you, not to me or, or UNDP today. So I want to give you the last word. Well, I just would like to say, first of all, how honored I am and how happy I am to have this opportunity of speaking with you and speaking also through you to others who are participating in this discussion. I also would like to say, uh, express the occasion, express my admiration for the work that UNDC has been doing uh, over the years and under your leadership, it's clearly consolidated in directions that I personally attach a lot of importance to. And here I would uh, add something which to me means a lot, namely if my friend Mavul Haq, friends and classmate Mavul Haq had been here, uh, he's been dead a lot since 1998, had he been here, he would have been happy uh, in the way uh, under your leadership, the UNDC has been doing important things for people in general, everywhere, uh, irrespective of country and irrespective of time, today and tomorrow. And I'm very fortunate to be joining you in, in this discourse today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sen. That is a, a very humbling way to end for us in UNDP. And I think we would both probably be uh, in agreement if we simply say, let's dedicate today's first future development session to Mabubul Haq also, who, you. as you have made clear, has been so central to UNDP's own thinking um, and evolving thinking on human development, but also very much <clears throat> in partnership with friends, with um, colleagues such as you at the time, and this remains, I think, the vision of UNDP. It is a platform on which the best minds, the most real um, experiences about development come together, and hopefully uh, we can continue that tradition of inspiring development and, and smarter development and uh, hopefully more equitable and sustainable development. Professor Sen, all the best to you, and I, I don't dare to say it formally, but I hope it's not the last time that we have you on here, but we'll follow up on that. Bye-bye no, no. <laughs> for thank now. You. And thank you to all those who joined us today. It's been a real privilege to, to spend this time with you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.